from so yes, yeah, yeah. 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 the yeah. whole book. So you have managed to do it in two, three years. Go um, back to the country and get it. Yes. Yeah, so for the World Database Project, as we do this on a continual basis, so we are improving data constantly. We have a team of staff who work on this every day in the centre, and when we have edits coming, we, we continually coordinate with national governments and have it verified. That process can take months to get replied, yeah, but it's but, um, not it's, yeah. it's really big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for feeling my question, Melissa. Let's pass it back to you, Marianne. Um, because my interpretation of the question earlier was, you know, what if you then move on to the next bus and do your REI and you, you know you're, you're doing your, your detailed work and find that it doesn't actually match up with what in the data sets um, that you initially looked at through IBAT or WDPA. Um, so a mechanism like that to be able to feed that back is quite quite useful. Um, I think. And I guess the other thing this morning I participated, well, attended the um, workshop around um, the red list for ecosystem services. And that, I, I know that'll take a long, um, yes, a long time to um, uh, actually be fully implemented. They were talking about 2025 uh, as the date when they would hope to have a global red list of, of that. But um, it seems to me like that's another kind of ground true thing mechanism that may eventually be able to come online. Okay. A couple of points on this. I think um, uh, yeah, WCMC tried to do this a few years, years ago. It was called Eco iShare and uh, there wasn't much response from industry as far as I understand because not much of industry was willing to share sensitive information about what species and habitats they found at their sites. Secondly, it's not going to be worth industry feeding back what species they're finding compared with what's on the species grid um, before right now the species grid is based on the IUCN range map the extent of occurrence which is simply the range of which a species is, is found so um, there's going to be large areas of that uh, extent of occurrence which don't have the species in it so what the finer scale uh, uh, metric is uh, area of occupancy so that's the area of occupied habitat within that range <coughs> So once area of occupancy hasn't been determined for many um, species groups and has for many birds, but uh, not for many species groups. So I think mean, the species, once AO, area of occupancy, which is the occupied habitat within the species range, if we base the species grid on that, then that would be a, 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 a great advancement in uh, both the red list and in IVAT. And then it would be useful for companies to feed back uh, at that level. But right now, there's been <coughs> lots and lots of examples where the species predicted to occur within that um, grid on my map simply aren't uh, at the site. Yeah, I was just going to say, and also just thinking about this, is that again, IBAT is one of the first stop shop. And so the other shops that exist in, in South Africa, there's you know, SANBI, the South African National Biodiversity Institute, has a tool, but it's like the EIA advisor or something that captures national information and makes it available to you. There's similar, there's a similar system in Colombia called Dramatos, which Captures Colombian data that goes far beyond the redness to KBAs and particular areas. So I think again, using IBAT as you know that first stop, and then there are other many other filters in addition to also GIS data. So using you know Esri GIS systems, uh, TNCS database and tool, which does a similar job where you can actually upload um, location-specific information, and analyze that in the context of your project. So it goes from a, a very first, very I think clearly scoped tool to then greater de levels of detail and information gathering that can be used more flexibly beyond a very, I think IBAT's quite a fixed approach to accessing the data versus a much more flexible, say, GIS system um, also. So. I think, uh, well, two things that make, from, from a financing institution perspective and also from our clients, there are two principal reasons I think what makes IBAT so useful. One is that it, it saves an enormous amount of time. Um, we, we click anywhere on the globe and then collate this information from the, for the highest priority areas and put them on one screen. Um, that would take sometimes, um, I mean, it, it literally might take two days of work to go to BirdLife, to go to you know, IUCN, Red List, to go to um, the World Database Protected Areas. Um, so, and, and IFCs is custom, so we have a couple of other layers on there as well. Um, we invested into the tool up front so we can make it custom made for our purposes. Um, and that was really helpful for us. Um, 
The second thing is it provides um, an understanding of risk across your landscape. So um, not only the project site, but nearby, I need to know if perhaps not on my project site, but I need to know if, if uh, you know, 100 kilometers away there is an Alliance for Zero Extinction site. And I really want to know that if I'm planning some kind of associate, if the client is planning some kind of associated facility or something like that. So just looking <coughs> at all of, um, you know, southwestern uh, Guinea, for example, um, I need to understand all of the high priority areas um, in that region, not only on that site. And um, that has just been, I can't tell you how much time, and really that, that's financial resources, the resources that has saved for screening risks on projects. Excellent. So clearly Aba has got its uses. Um, my question here. Hi, um, Matthew Clark from IUCN Netherlands Committee. Um, two, two questions, one sort of technical and one market-based, I guess. Um, the market-based one is, a couple of years ago, Conrad and I sort of tried, well, Conrad came along to a, a, a large uh, retail conference in Europe and tried to sell iPads to the retailers in Europe and their agribusiness suppliers. And I'm just wondering what the uptake um, of IBAT has been in some different sectors. I think it's great that the, the, you know, the mining metals sector have just basically pumped its money and, and have created this great tool which is now applicable for a number of sectors, you know, not only banking and finance and, and, and high impact sectors, but other sectors as well who are facing different types of risks. So what has been the sort of uptake within different sectors? And maybe you can just give a few different experiences around that. Uh, and my other question is sort of a bit related to more national values. Um, does IBAT currently um, cover certain nationally protected habitats? So not only protected areas and certain key biodiversity areas, but also nationally protected habitats. And I'm thinking sort of maybe coastal habitats, mangrove habitats, certain things that maybe not in, within protected areas, but are sort of nationally protected. And of course, nations protect lots of different types of habitats for different types of reasons. In Europe, we have habitats directives, so it's quite clear how we approach that at a European level, but in, in, in Africa and, and, and South Syria, some countries may be very different. So, sort of technical question on different types of protected habitats at national level and uptake in different sectors of either. Thanks. Very interesting questions. You'd like to give a stab at either of them. Um, in terms of the other sectors question, you know, when I was sitting there in Germany, I had a great time. Um, I guess the, the issue with, with, with other sectors, I'm going to pass it to Martin actually, have his thoughts on this, I'll take a picture of you back. But um, the key issue that we've, we've had with the ag sector is that they repeatedly claim it's difficult to track back to the original supplier. And so without that information in terms of the spatial point of, of where the farm is or the location is, it's really difficult to then place that point on a map that IBAT is, where IBAT is useful. So in the absence of that, that fundamental piece of information, I bet is very useful. Um, whether that, how much that claim is true across the sector, different opinions exist. I mean, some sectors or some companies claim they do track that information, and, but haven't really come to IBAT yet. Others say it's impossible to do, which mystifies me. And again, given you work on supply chain issues, Matthew, I'm sure you can talk about this a lot more than I can. Um, in terms of, of the nationally protected, and actually I'll have Mark talk about the other sector uptake. So beyond extractives and the finance sector, you want to give an example? Chip in, I, I can certainly chip in on that. And I think it's, you're right, the, there is opportunity there for us, I think, to try and promote the type of service that we're providing through our into a number of other sectors. Uh, most notably those with supply chain challenges, I think, is, is where we have struggled, actually, to be honest, to get any degree of, of traction. They all talk about, you know, Unilever talks about, you know, total su uh, sustainable supply chain by 2020. Yeah, they have this tiny, we think the CSR team is in the extractives are small. Uh, when you come to a, you know, a company like Unilever, you expect there might be some investment in that, it's actually tinier. And so, and, and where I think the challenge there is, is whose responsibility is it? Is it corporate? Is it the regional distributor? Is it some sort of sub-regional distribu distribution network? Or is it the individual you know, stakeholder who might only have one or two fields that he's feeding up the chain? And I think there is a challenge 
uh, in terms of who, where that responsibility lies. Uh, if we take someone like you, know, I think they have they source tea from somewhere like 250,000 different sites or something. The magnitude of, of coverage that you're potentially talking about is huge. Um, so it is an area that I do want us to get into. I think we do have a bank to play. I think the challenge rests very much at the corporate level. That still is that they don't honestly know where they're actually getting stuff from. I suspect, and that's actually what they should actually find out. If they division of labour there is actually if you get actually your regional, your sub-regional, your individual. Uh, landlords to tell you where they are, then you can actually do some pretty interesting analyses. You can actually do some very simple metrics, X percentage of our um, material store, whatever product it may be, whether it's cotton or wheat or whatever, is coming from areas that are regarded as priority types of conservation, and you can actually start to make some simple steps in that. I haven't got a company, actually we have one company that's just come on board through one of the, uh, from an NGO in, um, down in Mexico, I don't know if people will have heard of Grupo Bimba. Um, an unusual name, and not one that I've come across, but it's actually the second largest um, producer of confectionery, of, of baking goods, essentially. And they, I hope through that um, project and through their interest, we may start to, to get some penetration into this area. I think what we need is we need a leader. We look at what Starbucks has done in some of its work. We want a company like that to actually come on board and work with us to work out how can we actually apply some of this knowledge into the challenges you face. I had hoped that startups might, might come on board, but they've got their attention on other issues at the moment. But if someone like that, who I think is prepared um, to invest and look at these challenges, but I don't know if you're right, there are opportunities um, for us to expand beyond the network of, 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 of sectors that we're currently working with. And having said that, I mean, one of the first founders of IBAT was Cargill, which is a very large agribusiness company. Um, so they obviously saw value in this information, but again, with the absence of those points to then map it against, it becomes less useful. This is a bit tangential, but it relates to supply chain. So do you want to? Okay. okay, no, just to respond, um, a bit of a game changer here might be the, the uh, international finance institutions, because they're paying more and more attention to supply chain. And uh, I think it's um, the IFC's performance standard was the first IFI to put in supply chain requirements, um, both on the labor standard and in uh, performance standards since the Baldurski standard. So we should see more and more agribusiness companies looking at this, mapping that the hardest part is exactly what you said, is ma it's, called, it's mapping your supply chain, it's supply chain mapping. And maybe we'll even tie into tools like this. At uh, ourselves at TBC, the Biodiversity Consultancy, I think we're generally surprised that, that, uh, that IBAT hasn't been more broadly taken up by a number of uh, sectors and more deeply by individual industries within the sectors. If you look at the business uh, uh, cycle at an individual site, IBAT is useful certainly at the beginning at the end. And, um, we're often asked to do risk screening of uh, uh, portfolios of assets by my clients uh, and the data that's in IBAT is, is useful for that. Um, we, we, we've uh, been talking about risk screening so far a lot. When it comes down to individual site assessments, the data in IBAT such as the species grid is very useful to provide terms of reference for consultants to go and do uh, impact assessment. I, mean, impact assessment. I think EIA is a dinosaur that has not evolved it's still just a national approval tick box that uh, and it isn't managing company risk repeatedly companies are pointing out that EIA is managing risk um, um, the way they wish it to be um, after the individual I mean the individual site assessment might be a critical habitat assessment it's doing surveys etc so the um, essentially IBAC provides you with the uh, terms of reference um, for some of the species and habitats that you want to be looking for on the site then if you move down to say biodiversity action planning or uh, biodiversity management plan, the, uh, the landscape level data in IBAT, as Laurie pointed out, is extremely important in understanding indirect impacts. If you've got linear, linear infrastructure, to understand uh, what is in the landscape, uh, what the downstream impacts of uh, uh, what uh, the inter industrial activities might be. Um, I think then it's most useful if the company is looking at biodiversity offsetting, is that it provides this uh, range of options in the landscape um, with their uh, key biodiversity of most 
what's the data? It's 50%. Over 50% of uh, key biodiversity areas are entirely unprotected. So there's lots of additionality to do biodiversity offsets in key biodiversity areas. So IBAP provides the uh, set of uh, landscape options to do uh, um, biodiversity offset site selection. Um, and then if you were then going to uh, go on to offset design, once again, that I think IBAP is probably less useful there. Once again, this is more the site level uh, data that's required, which requires people there on the, on the ground. But there are many stages in that business cycle where IBAP can provide useful information. Um, I wonder how, we don't actually pay John anything for that comment, so thank you for that. Um, I want to go back to Matthew's second point about the, nas the, the nationally protected uh, habitats. But, um, very good question. Again, IBAT doesn't really offer much into that type of data. Um, part because that data isn't really compiled at a global level. Um, where it has, we've, we've had efforts to do that. So the IFC version serves uh, World Wildlife Fund's ecoregions, for example. We have an agreement there to kind of serve the ecoregions, which is, again, a parallel to a habitat level type mapping. Uh, we had a collaboration with the Internet Development Bank and TNC, which had a set of information actually developed by Danny Grossman on critical natural habitats in Latin America, so mapping out ecosystems. <coughs> again, so in the absence of, of globally compiled or regionally compiled data sets on that, we can't really do much. Um, and again, the, the cost of the IBAT compiling that becomes a question of forming a whole new data compilation process that kind of mirrors what the regulus does, which for us is really a, a, a viable uh, option. Thanks everybody, another question here. Thanks. You've talked about uh, companies that invested in developing IBAT, but today, how many companies have used IBAT? And the second question is, how much does it cost? <laughs> By the way, I love IBAT, but I'm just uh, asking these questions. Uh, excellent <laughs> questions. Let's have some answers from those who know the answers, which is probably Conrad, I guess, in this, this panel. I'm going to share this answer with Martin, actually. <laughs> um, but I will start off by saying, initially, when IBAT was free, uh, open access, is open access, but it was free. Um, we had over a thousand different subscribers. Um, from across. I bet for business. I bet for business. Um, I think partly because it was the, it was the first tool. Many of those users are also governments or conservation NGOs since I think migrated to the other versions. Um, but the current number of subscribers I think is hitting 40 or so. But it was a slide I put up earlier. It's approximately 40 companies. Um, yeah. And it, it costs. Okay, I'll do the costing one as well, there you go. Thanks. So what we do with the business community is we currently have a subscription service uh, which is based on annual revenue of the company and that is a tiered subscription service. So at the very top level, if your company's, net, if your company's revenue is greater than a billion dollars, then the annual charge for unrestricted use across all of your operations globally is $25,000. If you're a smaller fish in the, in the corporate world, and your annual revenue is between a billion and a um, hundred million, then it's 10,000. And then if you're below that, we have what at the moment is a pay-as-you-go model where you can come in and pick up individual country data sets uh, where we charge them uh, $500 for a country data set. I must say this is something that we've wrestled with extensively and I suspect there might be some interesting discussion that this will generate. Uh, it is something that's currently under review. Uh, it's actually been under review since the initiative started, to be honest. <laughs> but, that, but that's how the pricing works at the moment. Thanks, Martin. And of course, the other versions for government for researchers are free to the user. They are to corporate the data or all that for you to look at. I mean, it's probably going to ask us why we charge for it, but let's see what other questions you've got for that. Right, I'll ask the question, why are we charging for IBAT? <laughs> I'm not going to exactly answer that question. As a pure uh, comment from the consultancy sector, I think uh, IBAT is, if anything, grossly underpriced. Uh, if you compare it with what uh, many companies are paying consultancy fees and how much an EIA costs to complete, $20, $30 million in many cases, the value provided by IBAT um, is uh, extraordinary for $25,000 if you're a large corporation. The amount of data that's in IBAT, in terms of the red list data and all the uh, 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 site based data sets, it's very difficult to quantify how much that's cost over the years. There's several people in the room. John Pilgrim was sitting there. At the back, there were several of us who were naive and enthusiastic uh, 
and naturalists in the late mid late 90s who spent all of our summer holidays instead of partying uh, collecting data for the red list and then sitting uh, at bird life under the guidance of uh, Leon Bennett putting it into the, the uh, bird life uh, databases so the, the just so I can't I don't know if you've ever calculated the man hours to create uh, uh, Icin has done that for the red list, so it's just an, an enormous, I don't know, I don't, I don't know idea how much it is, but uh, it's, it's easy to underestimate the, how much time it's taken to create the base uh, data layers and then to uh, put them together. Yeah, and I'll add some, add some context to the question of, you know, why do we charge IFAT? IFAT was free initially. We had this, this grand vision of having uh, uh, maybe a few large companies or a few foundations um, support the underlying data to the point where it could be free to everybody else. Um, we very quickly discovered A, that that wasn't going to happen, and then B, our actual corporate partners, some of the actual founding members of IBAT from the, the CIS side and some of WCMC's partners, the Proteus partnership, um, actually came out quite strongly to tell us, listen, it's easier if you just have a subscription on this thing to access operational budgets versus philanthropic CSR type budgets. And that's probably the major driver why we actually looked into a, a costing or a subscription mechanism. Um, it wasn't really from our side at all. Um, the, the second point in terms of, um, yeah, again, as Martin leads to, we're